The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello and welcome to Open Tuesday, a weekly program providing you the latest information, resources, services, and community efforts taking place locally here in the Bronx and virtually. I'm your host, Sanji Lopez, and today is Tuesday, May 11th. Coming up, Assemblymember Karines Reyes joins us to share more about a petition calling to cap the cross Bronx and urging President Biden to include the Bronx in his $2.25 trillion infrastructure plan. Then we'll learn more about affordable internet service and community-owned networks with People's Choice Communications, a worker-owned cooperative started by a group of local cable technicians. After that, how were pediatric emergency department visits impacted by COVID-19? A Montefiore expert joins us to share this study and more. And One by One is a new clothing brand focused on community and change. Stay tuned to learn about how you can donate used clothing to their spring cleaning initiative. So please stick around. Open BXRX Tuesday starts now. Welcome to Open Tuesday on BronxNet. I'm your host, Sanji Lopez, and I'd like to invite you to get social with us at BronxNet TV on Instagram and Twitter and BronxNet Community Television on Facebook. The decade-long battle of Bronxites versus the Cross Bronx seems to be getting some leverage, with community leaders now calling to cap the expressway designed by Robert Moses in 1948. Joining us now to share more about the plan to cap the Cross Bronx is Assembly Member of Assembly District 87, Karines Reyes. Welcome, Assembly Member. Thank you so much for joining us. Happy to be here, Sanjay. Good to see you. Glad on I seen you as well. Um, so on to the topic, right? This is a very important initiative. Um, can you tell us what capping the Cross Bronx means exactly and what will it look like according to proposals? So capping the Cross Bronx or decking the Cross Bronx means kind of building a deck over the below, below grade portions of the Cross Bronx. So um, uh, the areas that are below street level um, and they're open, so you can see, if you stand up top of the street, you can see the trucks. It would mean creating, making that a tunnel and making the top of it either green space or reclaimed community space. Um, that's up to, up to us to decide, to, to, to decide as community members, but it just means that we would be covering those portions of the Cross Bronx that are below street level. Right. Uh, thank you for sharing, Assembly Member. And I know that the, the proposal was brought to you by a community organization called Loving the Bronx. Can you tell us more about how, how it will look? We have some in images that we want to share with our viewers. Yeah. So Loving the Bronx actually came to me with this years ago. And it, it's, it's a study that was um, developed by uh, Dr. Peter Muning from the Columbia University uh, Mailman School of Public Health, where they study just asthma rates, and uh, things that they can do in, in major highways or, or urban cities to address kind of the pollution in those areas. And the Cross Bronx was one of those. So uh, there, particularly the Cross Bronx, because when it was designed by Robert Moses, it divided our, our uh, borough into two parts, the South uh, and the North Bronx. And um, because it's an interstate, we have, we get tons of commercial traffic and trucks going through the area, oftentimes idling because of the amount of traffic. And then all those pollutants get into the air um, and get into the, the residences of our, of our neighbors that we know many of them live right uh, uh, on the side of the Cross Bronx. And people who live in these areas have, can testify to the amount of soot and stuff that comes into the apartment that's debris from the Cross Bronx. Absolutely. And um, Assembly Member, I'm wondering how cost effective and feasible is this new plan? And if it's approved, how long um, should we expect it to take? Well, it's clearly a very ambitious and costly plan, right? Um, that's not to say the least, but uh, some estimates hover around 750 million. I believe it's probably going to cost more than that, right? When you factor in um, uh, just the, the work that has to get done. Um, and, and it's feasible. Well, once it's, 
it's physically feasible to do because there is precedent. Um, we've seen it in the, free, uh, the freeway park in Seattle on top of the I-5 and most notably the Boston's Big Dig had a very similar uh, project to this. Uh, the feasibility of the cost of it is, uh, of course, contingent on the federal infrastructure plan. And this is what we've been trying to do, that now the new Biden administration has put forth this $4 trillion infrastructure plan, 2.25 million trillion of it, which is supposed to go to actual infrastructure. Um, for us, we see it as an opportunity to really make sure that we bring in the funds to, to complete this project. And um, it's, it's 20, it's 20 um, billion dollars of it that is meant to reconnect um, communities that have been divided by highways and urban renewal. And that's the time, that's the money that we want to tap into. And we've been working to make sure that um, our, our U.S. Senate delegation and people in Washington know that this is very important um, for the Bronx and for the city of New York. Got it. Thank you for breaking that down. And um, you mentioned this earlier, um, but how has the cross Bronx exactly contributed to health disparities like high asthma rates in the Bronx, also leading to high COVID rates, no, in the neighborhoods around it? Right. Well, the Bronx has the highest rate of asthma in all of the country. Um, and that is because of systemic disinvestment in our health care, but because of, of um social and, and environmental justice issues like the Cross Bronx and what Robert, Robert Moses did in our communities. Um, we were able to reverse some of that with the Sheridan, right? Reconnecting parts of West Farm back with the waterfront. And we wanna do something similar here with the Cross Bronx, right? Kind of reversing those environmental justice issues that have been affecting our communities. And, and you know, our respiratory system is very much connected to our cardiovascular system. And what we've seen in COVID rates is um, the high uh, people dying uh, because of cardiovascular issues uh, related to COVID. And all of that stems from environmental issues um, in where we live and the communities that we live. So if we can start to mitigate some of that, then we anticipate that one, it's gonna it's gonna bring down the cost of of asthma treatments and and childhood um, asthma rates in our communities, but also for the adult population, cardiovascular issues that are again connected to uh, environmental pollutants like the Cross Bronx. Right. Um, I wanted to mention that the assembly member brings in her experience as a nurse, a longtime nurse, uh, to this issue as well. You know, health disparities are also a big issue that a lot of people can't. Uh, they don't know about because it's not visible to them, um, but it's something affecting us for, for years. So thank you again for breaking that down. Uh, you recently joined the Congressman Richie Torres, um, Loving the Bronx, Nilka Martel, and more Bronx sites at a press conference regarding the Cross Bronx. Uh, can you share more about what took place at this press conference? Yeah, so this was a culminating effort. Um, we've been working on this issue. The moment that this uh, federal infrastructure plan was announced, we saw it as an opportunity to pounce on the idea of making sure that the Bronx is represented and in the forefront of this planning. So uh, my office, uh, one, uh, along with the federal, state, and local electeds from the Bronx, sent a letter to Pete Buttigieg, um, who is, of course, spearheading the infrastructure plan efforts for the Biden administration to let them know about this plan and how we were requesting that this plan be, uh, that the Cross Bronx be included in the federal infrastructure plan. Uh, we also sent a letter to the U.S. Uh, Senate delegation asking them to advocate for this proposal in the final, in the final plan, if and when it passes. Um, and also we started that petition and we wanted to kind of bring attention to all the efforts that were taking place. Um, and how we want people to know that we haven't forgotten about this issue, that this is an issue that's very important to us. I mean, I live in the area, I breathe the pollutants as well, my children breathe the pollutants as well. And for me, it's about a public health issue, particularly during COVID, right? We, we have to um, be creative and think about the ways that we can be addressing um, all these issues that have been affecting us uh, long term. And it's gonna take more than just, you know, throwing money at healthcare it's going to mean that we're going to need community uh, leaders like Nilka Martel, like Loving the Bronx, to be creative and think about ways that we can address um, all the issues that are facing Bronx sites. Absolutely. And have we heard back from Pete Buttigieg regarding um, adding this to the infrastructure plan? Well, if you follow federal politics, you know that this is that this is a very contentious plan um, mm. and and they need to first pass it. So we haven't heard back, uh, but we did uh, host Senator Schumer right here in the Bronx in the, in the 87th district. He came by and we talked about this issue and how important it is for us. Um, and he agrees with me. 
you know, he loves the Bronx as well. And he loves New York City. And he knows that um, this money would mean so much for us. And it would be, I mean, it, I think it would be a model also for the rest of the country, uh, what you can do in an urban, in an urban setting to really address health disparities and environmental justice issues. Um, so we're talking to our, our US delegation and letting them know how important this is. And um, we have them on board and we just need them to advocate. And, and hopefully this plan gets through the federal government and we're able to be, we're able to include the, the cross Bronx in it. Okay. Um, and if you can just emphasize, Assemblymember Reyes, um, how Biden's $2.25 trillion infrastructure plan uh, can actually ha help this become a reality for the Bronx? Well, because all these things cost money, right? Uh, and like we said, this is a very ambitious and costly plan. And uh, this is a uh, investment in infrastructure like we've never seen. This is unprecedented. Um, and, and we never had an opportunity to really dip into a pot of money to, to make significant infrastructure changes in our communities. Oftentimes, it's kind of like patch jobs, right? You, you repave roads, um, but never the uh, significant amount of money to make huge infrastructure changes like we could possibly see with this project. Um, and this would mean um, connecting the North and the South Bronx. It would mean that we would be able to reclaim space um, for our community, create more green space for recreational purposes. And also this project would create hundreds of jobs in our communities. And there is a proposal in this plan also to make sure that the people who, are, who would be working and doing this, this infrastructure work would come from our communities. And, and communities like the West, West, West Farms that I represent have had record unemployment rates. Um, so this is um, a well-rounded plan that would impact so many aspects of the daily lives of the people in the Bronx. Right. Um, so without further ado, how can people find out more information about the plan to cap the Cross Bronx? I know that you have a petition going around. Um, where can people see it and read more? Yeah, we have a petition. It's on my assembly website, but um, folks who can follow me on Instagram could find the link under my bio and click on it and sign the petition because we really want to show community support. We want people to know, we want our federal delegation to know that the community is behind this and this is important to so many people in our neighborhoods. Thank you again, Assembly Member Reyes, for joining us today and sharing more about this plan. My pleasure. Good to see you. It's nice seeing you as well. Assemblymember Karines Reyes is a, the, repre the representing uh, assembly member in District 87. You can follow her on Instagram at Karines Reyes 87 and see the link in her bio to see the petition to cap the Cross Bronx. We'll be right back here on Open BXRX Tuesday. Wednesday, Bronx Borough President Ruben Diaz Jr. alongside elected officials and sponsors gathered at a press conference to kick off Bronx Week 2021 at the New York Botanical Garden. Skipping last year's Bronx Week due to the pandemic, this year's event will be a celebration of moving forward with life after COVID. All of the anxiety, the loss and the pain uh, that we've experienced over the last 13, 14 months. And so we debated this and we... Um, we agonize over whether or not to move forward. This is not going to be as big as previous Bronx weeks, but it is time. The annual event is also BP Diaz's final Bronx week as borough president. During the kickoff, BP honored the newest members of the Bronx Walk of Fame, which included Grammy award-winning DJ Kid Capri, music executive Saul Abatello, and photographer Joe Conzo Jr. As a photographer, I've been shooting this event for almost 20 plus years, but now to be on the other side of it, being honored, it's, it's pretty amazing. Honorees express how proud they are to not only be inducted, but to represent our borough. And what makes the Bronx so special? We've gone through so much. We've birthed the culture of hip hop. We have created Latin jazz, doo-wop, so much music-wise in community activism. Our culture, our music, for our sports, for our education, how uh, we've re been rebuilding it, how the population is growing, and all the great things that I got to do as a child here. 2021 Bronx Week will be taking place from Wednesday, May 5th to Sunday, May 16th. Stay tuned each day and enjoy Bronx Week right here on BronxNet TV. To see the full list of Bronx Week 2021 events, you can visit ilovethebronx.com. Reporting for BronxNet, Ashley Tiffany.
Welcome back. In response to high broadband service prices and poor internet service, a group of cable technicians on strike created their own internet service provider, or ISP, called People's Choice Communications. And they've already started providing low-cost internet access in an effort to bridge the digital divide here in the Bronx. Joining us now to share more are co-founders of People's Choice Communications, Troy Walcott and David Pavon. Thank you so much for joining us, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Of course. Um, so for those who are not familiar, we gave a little introduction, but can you please tell us more about People's Choice Communications and your mission? Well, People's Choice Communication, um, like you said earlier, is a group of eight, 1,800 of us went on strike against Spectrum Cable. 40 years before that, we spent building out the entire infrastructure for New York City's cable system. Um, once they put us on strike in 2017, we tried to come up with the idea first to have municipal ownership where the city would own the cable system. We pooled our money together to put a business plan together for that. But after not getting any response, we thought of the next idea. Why don't we, the people who built the system, combine with the customers who want the service, kick out the middleman, and we can have ownership of the system, which is what the idea we will present today, which is um, People's Choice Communications, a company for the cable system owned by both the employees and the people who use it. Oh, thank you so much for sharing, Troy. And I heard that this is one of the biggest strikes so far in U.S. history, no? Yep, correct. Unfortunately, <laughs> we have the title of having one of the, the longest strikes in uh, U.S. history. Wow. Um, but thank you for sharing the background of People's Choice Communications. It sounds like an incredible effort um, for the community. What are some of the challenges and issues with connectivity, specifically in the Bronx, if you can share? Yeah, there is, there's, there's a lot of talk. There's so much talk about the digital divide, places where people can get, um, can't get um, access services. Well, there are some places where the access, some places where the access is to the services too far. Yeah. Then there are places like in the Bronx where service is all around us, but these big companies control all of, control all of it. And, um, and make the cost to get it so high so people are blocked out from getting it because the lack of money, the challenge we face here is, is affordability. And when we talk about COVID-19, we know that uh, COVID-19 has exacerbated the digital divide our communities have faced. A lot of kids have been offline due to remote learning. Uh, can you show, share more about the impact that COVID-19 has had on the digital divide? Yeah, it's been devastating. I mean, we been on strike after three years at that point. Of course, we faced it, but it doesn't compare to some people who have been um, putting through this problem for even longer. So people now who are stuck in their homes who didn't have access to things as, as critical as school or telemedicine, court cases. So now you were blocked off in one respect and now you would get cut off completely in another. While people were at home and had to gather in their homes, now communication from the outside world was taught off, cut off almost totally, and that was because of last, this, this lack of access. And then when the, the people that caused the problem, the cable companies, were asked to do something to solve it, they still turned around and blocked people from getting service because old bills were, were unpaid. So we saw this as a problem um, that needed to be solved, and luckily there was a philanthropic effort where money was specifically put forward to try to fix that problem as fast as possible. And we had the skills in order to be able to fix that. So the two of us uh, came together to be able to pro provide immediate relief, immediate relief, especially during a COVID-19 crisis. Right. And one of those um, networks that you're trying to develop here in the Bronx is actually called community owned networks. Uh, can you define that for us and, and help us understand what they will mean for Bronx sites? Dave, I think I'll let you take that one or you want me to take it? Yeah, you could take it. Yes. So the community owned network, um, and this is the best part of what we have is now that the community has a stake and ownership in, in this part of the system, what it will do is provide both such social and economic empowerment to the same communities that were once underserved for service. So now the imagine you being cut off from cable and now having ownership of it, what would you do with it? It is a great um, ability to add that impact immediately to these underserved communities. And you can imagine going to the same store that you go to get your breakfast sandwich in in the morning, and that's still a turnaround and buying internet service from the, the same community that it serves. I mean, it's a great opportunity to add both social and economic power to those people. 
Right. And as you both mentioned, um, you've installed several antennas throughout the Bronx so far. Uh, can you share where this initiative is already being used and how it's going? I mean, in a short space of time, we've been able to co cover a large swath of the Bronx. So we're going all the way down from uh, the bottom of the Bronx and even Mott Haven all the way up to Ford Fordham Heights. And we have the capacity to expand even further. And then um, right now, we're just continuing to build out that network and be able, the more people that add to the network, the stronger it becomes. So we just recently also moved into Manhattan and we would look to expand from there. Um, can we emphasize on some of the benefits of community-owned networks a little more in case people are tuning in and they're like, oh, I just want to learn more about it? The benefits of, well, the benefits of having a community ownership of the networks is the interest of the companies coincides with the users. What companies would deeply dedicate profits improving underserved communities more than the people who live there and would actually benefit well, you know what they would actually benefit from it, not just token charity gestures from the media, but actually structural improvements to the community that provide long lasting social, long lasting and social, the, um, the network and, you know, in, in the interest of the company coincides with the users. And if you can also discuss why it was important for you both um, and your colleagues to give back to the community in this way through a co-op. I think it's because we we from here. <laughs> you have a everybody has a vested interest in the places that they are from. So I mean, we're from New York City. Uh, companies like Spectrum came from outside of New York City and completely took over and looked to disenfranchise the workers that were part of New York City. Um, they looked to raise prices on the customers because they had no other choice. Disrespected elected officials of the city because what could they care for anything more besides profits? But when you live in that community and you you have a stake there, you want to see things improve. You want to see things get better. And instead of just having somebody come and uh, do an event and give away a couple of laptops to make it look good on TV, I want to have a daycare center built into my community where I can, a mother can drop off their kids so they can go to work and provide a better life in the long term, not some kind of token justice. So if the community owns it, we, we want to see it work because it's for us. Right. And That's speaking cool. of that, I also wanted to bring up that uh, the city did enact a law um, to provide affordable broadband services to those who need it. And apparently uh, these Internet service providers are against this. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? You know, and, and this is really related to what we're talking about right now. No. Yes, definitely. Um, at last I've seen, I've been trying to watch and monitor that situation as well, because honestly, if the if the city can force them to do that and that they have to force them, it would be great because the best thing to do, if, whether it's us or anybody else, is to be able to give these people immediate access to this service because it's critical. But I just don't think it's happened. From my understanding, they're already forming up teams to fight this legally. They're gonna fight being able to give this. And then the second part of this is even if it goes through, what's considered affordable? We've seen so many times where people say affordable housing, but affordable according to who? So even say, if they create so many barriers where maybe 20 people or a couple of hundred people can get this $15 an hour um, service. What about everybody else who they considered not at that poverty level who are still struggling just to be able to connect to the rest of the world? That's definitely a big concern. And I know that you'll be holding in partnership with your partners uh, and the People's Co Choice Communications are holding a Zoom meeting today. Uh, how can people RSVP to learn more? And can you tell us a little bit more about what, what will be going on at this meeting? Yes. So one of the partner organizations that we um, met with to, to expand this model is Metro IAF. So they are already heavily active in the community and helping out, especially um, things like uh, NYCHA residents is setting up programs for them. They have put together a forum where mayoral candidates are going to be coming to hear about the community's uh, problems around education and the digital digital divide. So tonight that Zoom meeting will be held and everyone's welcome to attend. If you want, you can go on to um, peopleschoice.coop, the website. We'll have a link for that Zoom meeting tonight where you can sign up and listen in and hopefully address some of these questions to the candidates that are running for mayor. And that's taking place at 6 p.m., right, Troy? 6 p.m. tonight, yeah. Got you. Um, finally, um, thank you both for joining us, um, but how can people find out more and sign up for free and affordable internet? Is that an option right now for folks? Well, right now, we, you could just go to our website at um, peopleschoice.coop and sign up to see if, if, um, if you can receive service 
And if, if not, at least, you know, you, you can support us and, and support everything we're doing. I read on your website that the more people that sign up, the more powerful this becomes. Uh, can you tell us more about that as well? Yes. Yeah, so um, one of the things we found out, even though we provide cable service, uh, you got you figure out about the buying power behind it after you're out of the system. So if you think about it, if we have a um, hundred, a thousand band, a thousand megabits of service and we want to, people buy that in bulk and people with money buy it because they just like to have the extra there at the side in case they use it. So now what if you take that thousand and you spread it amongst a hundred people. Now you can provide service to those people and that price splits. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how the network works. We're buying the service in bulk. And now the we have more than enough service to provide to people, but because people are sharing the cost and there's not a hundred million dollars of profit being paid to one CEO, we can take that money, distribute it to more people. And the more people that come in, the stronger the system becomes, the further we're able to expand and the more we'll be able to re reinvest back into the system and the community. Thank you again, Troy and David, for joining us today and sharing more about People's Choice Communications. Thank you so much for the opportunity. We appreciate having a chance to get to speak to you. Thank you so much for having us. Of course, it's been a pleasure. Again, folks, Troy Walcott and David Pabon are co-founders of People's Choice Communications, and they're seeking to bring affordable services for internet and broadcast here in the Bronx. So stay tuned and learn more about them. Uh, OpenBXRX, we'll be right back. We know that people are dealing with the health crisis, but there's also a lot of food insecurity. We're giving out healthy food options, and that's what's key here. If you're a senior, you have a disability, they'll actually deliver meals to you. The residents are anxious, they're worried, they're scared, and they want to be tested. When things were happening in our community, and, and we couldn't get the help. And there's almost a presumption of criminality that, that attaches to your skin color. The site will prioritize those who are at highest risk in the population. If you feel symptoms and you'd like to visit one of these COVID-19 testing sites here in the Bronx, you may call the State Health Department's hotline. Important to note about this site is no reservations are needed. This is a walk-in clinic. A lot of us are out of work and looking for something to do. We have the machinery and the skills to make large scale of these masks and gowns. Take care of your people. Well, it's going to go way further than we actually can understand. Right now, employees like myself are just adjusting to the new reality. Welcome back. The Bronx has the highest incidence of asthma in the United States and was also an early COVID-19 epicenter. How were pediatric emergency department visits impacted during COVID-19? Joining us now to share more is Dr. Rachel Levine, a fellow at the Division of Pediatric Emergency Medicine at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore, or CHAM. Welcome, doctor. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. 
Of course. Um, let's get right into it. Um, doctor, can you first give us some background on this study pertaining to asthma and COVID-19? Sure. So when we learned that COVID-19 was a respiratory virus with a substantial effect on the breathing system, and knowing that respiratory viruses trigger asthma exacerbations, we were appropriately concerned about the children in the Bronx who suffer from asthma. And as you said, the Bronx has the highest incidence of asthma in the United States, and pediatric asthma in the Bronx is nearly twice that the national average. So because of all this, we anticipated a surge in presentations to our pediatric emergency department. Thank you, doctor, for that background. And what were some of your findings in the study? So contrary to what we thought with asthma, we actually found the opposite, that during, despite being located in an asthma hub, that during the pandemic, the relative percentage of asthma-related pediatric emergency department visits declined appreciably. Hmm. And also, in addition to our asthma findings, uh, we found that there was a substantial decrease in overall visits to the emergency department. But the children that did come in were much more sick and much more likely to be hospitalized than before the pandemic. And these findings we saw were sustained beyond the pandemic peak in April and May and lasted into the first two New York State phased reopenings, which brought us to about July 6th. 2020. Wow. Um, thank you for sharing, Doctor. And, um, you know, earlier today, we spoke about the environmental effects of highways like the Cross Bronx. Uh, doctor, what can you say about the relationship between infrastructure and childhood asthma here in the Bronx? So it's well known that, you know, there's a complex relationship between both genetics and outdoor and indoor environmental factors okay. in the development and exacerbation of asthma. Uh, among the environmental factors, those associated with inner city living, like the ones you just mentioned, highways and infrastructure, have been shown to contribute towards an asthma diagnosis. You know, in overall, environmental factors are multifactorial. There are many, but certainly poor air quality, in part, does contribute to asthma morbidity. And I also wanted to share that a neighborhood in Mont Haven, as many of us know, in the South Bronx is referred to as Asthma Alley. What are some other factors and reasons behind disproportionate risk from air pollution and climate change in our borough? So, you know, our study uh, was not meant to evaluate factors behind the disproportionate risks from pollution and climate change that do very much exist in the Bronx. You know, but when it comes to Asthma Alley, health experts have long attributed the poor air quality to excessive roadways, densely packed toxic waste facilities, um, densely packed bus depots, overcrowding, just to name a few. And this is an area that definitely warrants further investigation. Right. Um, and doctor, you mentioned that uh, patient emergency department visits were lower during the pandemic. Uh, does your research suggest that less children visited pediatric emergency departments during COVID because they weren't exposed to harmful air pollutants? Is that what the study says? No, not necessarily. You know, our study was not able to evaluate the exact reason behind the decrease that we did see of children coming into the emergency department. And again, it is definitely multifactorial. There were school closures and social distancing measures, and all of these efforts ultimately decrease our exposure to different viruses that we know trigger asthma. In terms of pollution, like you mentioned, improved air quality in part because their traffic on the roads and in the air was reduced may have positively impacted asthmatics. Um, also, shelter-in-place orders were designed during the high pollen season in the spring of 2020, mm -hmm. and so that had to reduce allergy-induced asthma exacerbations that we usually see in the spring. Right. What does all of this mean for patients and doctors alike, like yourself? So, you know, when managing a complex chronic disease like asthma, it really does take a community. The key is now to try and understand the reason behind the patterns that we observed in our study. So we can't change genetics, we can't change those components, but doctors and patients can work together towards modifying some of the infectious and environmental exposures that we do know trigger asthma. And can we talk a little bit about um, those uh, resources and services available to patients in the Bronx at CHAM, um, for instance, Doctor, if you can share just some of those programs. 
Sure. So, you know, we do have asthma specialists at the Children's Hospital at Montefiore. We have a pediatric asthma center. More information on that can be found at our website. Uh, that is www.cham.org. We also uh, can connect with uh, the community over our Twitter handle, which is at Montefiore Peds. Thank you. Um, can you also share what percentage of COVID-19 hospitalizations consisted of asthma patients at the height of the pandemic? Is that something that the study measured at all? No, our study did not specifically look at active COVID-19 infection in known asthmatic patients. Uh, many children with asthma were hospitalized for COVID. And while asthma has been described as a risk factor for developing more severe COVID-19 illness, asthma may or may not have had a role in their specific hospitalization. So you can't make that conclusion uh, right off of what we know now. Right. Um, what are we seeing now in your department, doctor? Are more patients coming in, you know, for preventative care? Are they more, um, you know, able to, I mean, confident in coming into the hospital? And I know a lot of folks during the height of the pandemic were really worried and concerned about, you know, safety at a hospital. Definitely. And rightfully so. I, I will say confidently people are, are returning back to the emergency department. Um, and I think a lot of the pandemic fear is starting to subside uh, you know, with all of the different measures and vaccination efforts that have been out there. But we are seeing a return back to what we once knew. As a fellow, what can you tell um, people in the Bronx about managing asthma and, you know, managing pediatric asthma in particular? So, you know, as I mentioned before, there are certain things that we can't control genetics um, in, in terms of getting involved with local governments and lobbying for infrastructure that, you know, is, is it surrounds us with more healthy options um, so that we don't have our asthma exacerbated, we can do that. But for the day-to-day -day families, recognizing the efforts that social distancing had, such as mask wearing, frequent hand washing, and how that positively impacted asthmatics. We don't want people to feel restricted forever with social distancing measures, but keeping in mind the things that did work during the pandemic and trying to sustain those efforts moving forward. Right. And is there anything that we can do at home um, in regards to, you know, minimizing, minimizing the factors of asthma early on? So, in, yeah. So you can definitely try and improve your air quality in the home as much as possible. Um, that is hard when there's a lot of, you know, external forces working against us. But what you can do in your home is making sure you have humidification and purified air, trying to decrease the kinds of allergens that do exist in the home. A lot of that comes from different animal dander or smoke exposure. Anything you can do to limit that will certainly help. Uh, but certainly you should definitely consult a pediatric pulmonologist and an asthma specialist or an allergy and immunologist to discuss these uh, measures further. Thank you, Dr. Rachel Levine, for joining us today and speaking more about this topic. Um, before we go, how can people find out more about these studies and connect with CHAM? So on our website, you can go to www.cham.org and you can look up our pediatric asthma center and find an asthma specialist as well. You can find us on our Twitter handle. Uh, you do have an ongoing event going on, right, with the with the virtual presentation of these studies as well, which is where we found out about um, this specific one. Um, are they still happening? Are people able to to join in? So this study is actually uh, it, it was selected to be. Um, presented at a national pediatric conference called Pediatric Academic Society, which is how I believe you found out about it. We also have it showcased locally at our hospital. Um, and you can go to the website to find out more information about that. All righty. Doctor, I'm also curious to learn how you got to the Bronx. Um, why did you decide to, to you know, pursue uh, pediatric medicine? And, you know, what fuels you in continuing to, to aid our children here in the Bronx? Sure. I'm a, I'm a native New Yorker, born and raised. I did my, I'm, so I'm a general pediatrician, board certified, and now I'm training as a pediatric emergency medicine specialist. I did my pediatric training and chief residency training in Brooklyn at SUNY Downstate and Kings County and uh, from Brooklyn, I, I decided to move up to the Bronx. Um, I sort of am interested in, in going to different boroughs in New York, and that's how I wound up there. I've always been interested in pediatrics. Before that, I was a public school teacher in East Harlem. How has it been going for you during the pandemic? Um, there's another study about burnout when it comes to um, pediatricians, and a lot of your departments were actually taking care of adults during COVID, no, doctor? 
We sure were. Um, it's only recently that we have stopped. So, you know, I think burnout is real. Um, my department is very close. Uh, we have a lot of resources for us available to combat burnout. You know, we all sort of banded together and went through this together. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we, we did the best that we could. There were people ultimately who had it much worse than we did. And, you know, as a team, we kept each other going. But it definitely has been a long year and a half. Thank you, Dr. Levine, for your time today. We're always happy to have you and other Montefiore specialists on our program. Thank you for your work in our community. Thank you for having me. Again, Dr. Rachel Levine is a fellow at the Division of Pediatric Emergency Medicine at CHAM Montefiore. We'll be right back here on Open BXRX Tuesday. This book is a visual history, a scrapbook of my upbringing in the Bronx. The Bronx Documentary Center hosted a socially distanced evening of hip-hop history featuring legendary photographer Joe Conzo Jr. and hip-hop pioneer Grandmaster Kaz discussing Conzo's iconic body of work, Born in the Bronx, a visual history of the birth of hip-hop. So this is our, our first in-person event. Um, we decided to do it in the courtyard um, and the outdoors as well, uh, just to make room for a lot of folks. I had no idea what I was documenting that would become so important in today's culture we call hip-hop. And again, I was just a chubby little kid taking pictures back then of my friends that I grew up with. Well, I mean, prior to, to, to photographs, flyers were hand-drawn and made. And so uh, there were no images of the artists. There were just names. Um, Joe put a face on, 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 those, uh, on those names. And uh, he, uh, along with other people, started to document the culture in a way where you can really see it. It's like you're there. Through his lens, Conzo tells a story of how hip-hop music rose through the ashes and decay in the Bronx between the 1970s and 80s. So even with all that devastation or anything like that, you still found music and you still found family. The book also features Conzo's most iconic work, which he shares were actually accidents. This is actually a mistake. My flash didn't go off. And when I developed the film, I was so upset because the flash didn't go off. So I have a series of pictures where the flash went off. But looking back at it now, it's one of my most iconic photographs because of the silhouette. You didn't mean to do that. <laughs> the way that light just shines between us, it created that ring around the microphone. I mean, you couldn't plan that. You couldn't plan that. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. saying. <laughs> Kanto co-authored the since sold out and out of print original Born in the Bronx book in 2007. Participants got an opportunity to purchase and receive autographed copies of a new re-release version at the event. We did 8,000 copies of that and it's so hard to find where you see it on eBay for over $1,000. So we got together and, you know, decided to re-release it, but an expanded version of it. The new expanded edition of Born in the Bronx, A Visual History of the Birth of Hip Hop is available for purchase on 1xrun.com. Make sure to follow at Bronx Documentary Center on social media for future events. Reporting for BronxNet, Sanji Lopez. Welcome back. Our next guests are bringing streetwear with a purpose here in the Bronx. One by One NYC is a clothing brand created by individuals who not only have a passion for fashion, but who also have a passion for igniting change. Joining us now to share more of are two out of four co-founders of One by One NYC, John Flores and Edgar Cecilio. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us, gentlemen. Hello, hello. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you Sony. Uh, thank you, everybody, for having us. Uh, we appreciate this opportunity. Of course. It's a pleasure having you guys. So we're here to learn about your brand one by one. Can you tell us about it and your mission? Sure. Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, so basically one by one is a 
is a streetwear clothing brand mm -hmm. where their mission is to give back to the community. Right. And um, John, do you want to add on to that, bro? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We basically just wanted to create our own brand. Um, as we all know, like streetwear and fashion is a huge part of our culture down here in the Bronx. Uh, it's a huge part of our influence about who we are and our identity. Uh, mm -hmm. So we just wanted to uh, spread our own influence and spread our own um, ideas and uh, also give back to our communities, the communities that, that we love and um, that we live in. Yeah. I love that that's part of your mission as a clothing brand. I, I want to learn a little bit more about you guys. So there's four of you. Right now, we only have two of you on the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, shout out to the other two guys. Um, but I just want to learn how you all met and when you decided to create this clothing brand together. So basically, long story short, we all come from the same neighborhood. Mm -hmm. We met at our local park, which is St. James. Um, we started to play soccer. Um, and then from that, that turned into like a huge friendship. And then this whole thing started in high school where we simply, my one of our friends that's now the co-founder too, made a design. We liked the design and we printed it on a mall and we just thought it was cool. And from there, um, fast forwarding to college, we all decided we should like turn this into like a business, you know, where we are able to develop our ideas and, and things that we think that people are gonna like. And at the same time, we can find ways how we can give back from that. So that's that's pretty much how we it all came about. And we're just hoping to, you know, expand from here. That's amazing. And I want to add, you know, a lot of times um, the youth and especially young men in the Bronx are often given this prescribed this negative stereotype, right? That there, mm -hmm. there can't be entrepreneurship and, you know, people are always violent. Young guys are always violent. So it's great to hear that you all took, you know, your experiences collectively to create mm -hmm. a brand and, and be entrepreneurs in this way. Uh, so shout out to you for that. Um, thank why, you, thank you. Why was it particularly important for you to create a mission driven brand focused on the community in particular? Uh, I'll, can I answer this? But before I do, just shout out to Ruben Solano and Chris Aquino, our other two co-founders. Um, they're a huge part of this brand. Um, without them, it's a we're all it's a, we're a collective of four, uh, so we all move as one. Just shout out to them. Um, and yeah, basically, it was important uh, to create a a, a mission-driven brand for us uh, because, like you said. Um, uh, going back to our last question, we uh, we basically grew up playing soccer. We met at a park. Uh, we just, you know, became like that group of friends, you know, going out, um, doing silly stuff, sometimes getting into trouble, yes. Uh, but we always, uh, you know, stuck to our roots. We never meant to do any harm to anybody. We always just were trying to be fun, trying to be kids and have fun. Um, so that's a, that was a huge part of our influence, a huge part of our identity. Uh, but we would also see the community and see that some kids would not be as fortunate as us, or not ha um, get into ha try to have fun or get into trouble, uh, whether it be with the law or um, whatever the case may be. So we really just grew up around that also, and seeing that, and that also had a huge impact on us. Uh, so we really just wanted to give back or try to create change or try to be the change that we want to see in our community. Um, but also just be something different, like be a different brand uh, right. to just stand out from um, other clothing brands. We just wanted to be unique and while also mean, uh, bringing positivity to our communities. And I'm curious, what does the name One by One symbolize? Uh, how did you come up with that? So basically, is like a model we like to think about it and our model goes like this one by one is not just a brand it's a model that sig so that signifies success is not done overnight it's done by reaching goals one by one so we're trying to sell the idea that in life you know we all have our personal goals we all have goals that we want to reach by a certain due date however these goals don't achieve the next day. These goals, in order to achieve these goals, you have to achieve smaller goals so you can get these bigger goals. So that's the the idea we wanna 
show the people that's one by one. Got you. Yeah. And yeah. you know, one thing that you are doing that I think is incredible is your spring cleaning initiative. Can you tell us more about that? Sure, sure. Um, our spring cleaning initiative really came about um, around the idea to try to get people to dispose of their clothing in a more eco-friendly manner. Um, and this is because I personally every year try to cleanse my living space and I'm sure a lot of other people do. And yes. we usually tend to throw things in the trash. Um, and that, and then I thought of an idea that because I try to donate uh, or get rid of my clothing, uh, whether it be recycling them or reusing them or donating them. So why not try to get other people to do the same thing and be more aware of, of the, the cause of throwing away their clothing or maybe seeing the other side of what their clothing might be. It could have another life after you get rid of it. That is very true. And I definitely have to do some spring cleaning myself. So now I know mm -hmm. where I can take my used clothing. It's lightly used clothing, clothing, right? Yeah, it's not yeah, like yeah. You know, things that yeah, you can yeah, read. Of course. Yeah, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say somebody's tuning in and they want to find out more. How can they participate and donate to you guys? So at the moment, we have uh, where you can reach us at social media, which is Instagram at one by one NYC. And from there, you can also reach us, reach to us through our website where we have a, a Google Docs list form where if you don't want, like, let's say, shoot us a DM, you can always fill out the form where you fill up your last name, the info needed so we can go pick up whatever you want to donate to us yeah. um involving clothing so we can donate to the right people and so far you've already worked with a few community organizations right a few community leaders to gather these donations at uh, i saw you guys at a garden recently um mm -hmm. how is it like building community relationships with people through your brand how how is that going for you guys uh that's been going great um because people see that we're a small brand trying to make a difference, uh, they they want to help us out and sometimes reach out to us and try to help us. Uh, but it's also important because we do want to help our community and it's important to just make friends and make connections and build networks uh, with things such as this. Uh, we, that's why we would love we love to and love to come here and be on this uh, channel to spread our message and uh spread our network even yeah now nah, it's great having you guys um as we said in the beginning um so without further ado i know people are watching and they're like yo let's see the clothes let's see some of the merch that they got going on so let's talk about two of your pieces and what they represent um we're gonna show them on screen it's the lightning long sleeve shirt and the bodega shirt sleeve so if you can just tell us a little bit about your pieces so basically this is part of our spring collection which is inspired by you know the found of money as you may notice, some of them involve money related, um, community related. So our very first piece is the long sleeves, which represents the power that we hold as a community. Mm. It takes, you know, all seeing eyes that can be found in the back of our dollar bill and transform it with the fist, with the transform of the fist and the lightning bolt, it represents strength. So that's the idea we was trying to sell with this piece. And then following with the other two pieces, or our last piece is the bodega one. Right. Uh, you know, um, as growing up in the Bronx, you, you see a bodega almost any any corner. Yeah. So a bodega definitely holds, you know, a meaning, you know, where we from, where we call home. And, you know, we just trying to spread that message of, you know, one by one. Right. So are you guys like in different um, departments at one by one? So you have four people. Is there an artist? Yeah, yeah. Like who, who does okay. what in the team? Shout out to Ruben Solano, the designer of the tees. Uh, these are strictly yeah. his design. But we, of course, uh, added our influence, but he really does his thing, um, designing our logos and stuff. We're also wearing, as you can notice, Edgar and I are wearing, um, he's wearing a t-shirt, I'm wearing the hoodie. Uh, mm -hmm. These were part of our debut collection, and they're also available on our website. Right. And yeah, so... so well, so yeah, shout out to Ruin um, for always putting up for the designs. Uh, and also, as I, I would like to say maybe as a team too, that we all put in um, the ideas and then that's when Ruin brings in, you know, the, the actual physical piece. Gotcha. That's how pretty yeah, much yeah. we work. So, well, uh, yeah, also like 
me personally, so we all, we all have our own different goals and our own different aspirations personally. Um, we're all also students in uh, university and college right now, uh, majoring in our own thing, trying to do our own uh, professions. Me personally, I'm majoring in finance. So that's why I decided to take charge of the company as part of like the financial uh, manager uh, and really take care of the books for the company or the brand right now. Uh, so our different roles entail to our different like aspirations or our different um, interests. Uh, so really we created our own opportunities and hopefully inspire other people to do the same thing. If other people don't really give you an opportunity, you can make your own. Yep, we learned that growing up in the Bronx, right? Thank you yeah, guys yeah, for, sure. for your time. So, um, no, it's really great meeting you. And, you know, before we go, how can people follow you and learn more about your brand without further ado? Uh, so at the moment, you can follow us at Instagram, which is one by one NYC. And also, we're, we're in the works of creating content, which we eventually will be called one by one talk. Oh. So it's in the making. So hopefully you yeah. can hear guys from there. And also our website, uh, which is one by one nyc.com, www. of course. And those are the only two places you can reach us. Sounds good. Thank you guys again for joining us, John Flores and Edgar Cecilio, our co-founders of One so by much. One. Um, it's been great Thank having you. Thank you for that pronunciation that. too. Very Hispanic, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, thank you both. So again, you can visit one by one nyc.com to find out more about this clothing brand based in the Bronx and follow them on Instagram at one by one nyc. That's all for our show today. I'm your host, Sanji Lopez, wishing you and your yours safety and wellness now and always. See you next time.